Okay, well, let's, uh, let's bow before the Lord before I start into the Word this morning. Jesus, we thank you that you do speak to us, God, through your Word. Your Word is power and life, and your Spirit brings it alive in us. So God, as I open the passage this morning that we are t- t- dealing with, Lord, we pray that you would give us insight and that we would hear hear from you, Lord, and you'd help us to grow stronger as we listen to the Word. And God, you know the issues that are out there with every person, and we just pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So today, for all of you who are regular attenders here, for the visitors you would know this, but we've been going through a series in the book of First John, and today we're going to actually be wrapping up the book of First John And uh, leading up to the close of his first book, the Apostle John has, um, in broad terms, I guess you could say when you look at a snapshot at at the book of 1 John, in broad terms he's discussed the nature and meaning of the gospel and, and boiled down to one fact, he talks about the sum, I guess you could say, of the full meaning of the gospel Uh, that is, that God has given us eternal life through the sacrificial offering of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now John uh, approaches the closing of his letter. He closes his letter to the churches with this fact in mind. So our text this morning, if you've got Bibles you'd like to turn with me, or if you want to follow along with the overhead, um, the text this morning is uh, 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 to 21. 1 John chapter 5, 13 to 21. So starting uh, with verse 13, we see uh, John brings up, first of all here, that we can have confidence as believers, we can have confidence in prayer. Reading from verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So John calls out, the letter is to the church, and he calls out to true believers saying that he's writing to them, not so that they might guess or kind of have a feeling that they might have eternal life. He's writing to believers to tell them these things that they may know that they have eternal life. There is assurance that God places in the heart of true believers. And in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus told those who were listening to him, he said this, he said, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. So God um, tells us in his word that we can have confidence that we have crossed over from death to life. And I've heard some people say, well, I'm just not really sure where I'm at. I want you to know that if you're in that position right now, you can be sure. Because when you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Spirit of God will bring that surety into you. Romans chapter 8, 14 to 16, the Apostle Paul tells us this. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption, adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. In English, Daddy. A closeness comes. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And there's this testimony that is born in us by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, that testifies that you belong to Jesus, that you are saved, that you, when you cross over from this world, in this flesh, to the other side, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I've heard people say that um, 
I can't have assurance of salvation because I don't know if I truly measure up to God's standards. After all, I, I see my life and, and how imperfect that I am. I, you know, some folks have a hard time with this. And to this person I say, you know, if you look at Christianity and your faith through that set of lenses, you're right. You are never going to measure up. You're never going to measure up to salvation standards. That is an impossibility because the heart of man is desperately wicked and prone to wonder from the living God. You cannot save yourself. You can't. You can't bring yourself to that point where you're going to be acceptable to God for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means all of us. It's true that the natural outflow of a believer's life, a true believer's life, is to obey the Lord Jesus Christ in the way that we live and the way that we carry ourselves. And if we find our lives are not surrendered to Jesus, it is a possibility that we've actually never really given Him our spirit. Because salvation comes when we surrender to the Lord and we repent and we say, God, I can't run my life on my own. I need you. Lord, I need you to take the controls of the ship and steer me, God. Take away my sin. Cleanse me. Fill me with your spirit and take me on your path, Lord. That heart is what brings salvation to us because God has, has died in our stead instead of us. It's not by our works that we're saved. It's, it's by His grace through faith and believing in what Jesus did on the cross for us that we're saved. We're not saved by what we do or what we do not do. Only faith Genuine faith by grace that we are saved. You see, nobody here is perfect. Is there anyone here who's perfect? I'm not perfect. You're not perfect either. We know this. So it's impossible for us to obey all of God's law. We must understand that when God comes into our hearts, He is the catalyst. The Spirit of God is the catalyst that changes our heart and helps us to walk in obedience. You're never going to be good enough to do it on your own. It's all about surrender. It's all about recognizing that you're a sinner but recognizing that God has called you by name and that he has provided a provision for you to be saved. And the Holy Spirit will testify when you come to that place where you surrender to the Lord as the Spirit draws you, the Spirit himself will testify that you are a child of God. And this brings assurance. We're confident that we are in fact the children of God and we have eternal life. And when we're confident that in fact we have eternal life and we're walking with the Lord, what does that mean for our prayer lives? That means when we pray, we recognize that we're not just talking to the wall. We can have confidence that He hears our prayers. And if we ask anything in accordance with His will, He will hear it. And we should not fear to pray for anything in God's will. And this is why John says in verse 14 and 15 of our text this morning, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And we know that He hears us. Whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of Him. You know, it's most certainly good for us I'm going to make a point on this. 
for us to grow in our trust of God and, and, and pray, Lord, increase my faith. Help my faith to increase. That's a great prayer. Because God desires for us to trust Him more. Receiving what we ask for in prayer is a powerful establishment of our faith. And it leads us to understand that God is real. That God is not just real, but He is powerful. And He is invested. He's invested. God cares very much what happens in your daily living. He's not some distant figure up there somewhere, just sort of watching at a distance. No. The Lord knows you. When you become His, He knows you by name. He knows everything about you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows absolutely everything. And He loves you. He loves you. And He wants what's best for you. He is your Abba, your Daddy, your Heavenly Father. It breaks His heart if we're doing things that break His heart. Why? Because He wants what's best for us. So, approaching the throne of grace in prayer ought to be a humble endeavor. You know, sometimes... People look at God the wrong way. They look at his, Him almost as a figure. Maybe it's because they've had a bad experience with a father. And, and they kind of look at God as though He's someone that they have to wangle a little bit to get what they want. Because He really isn't that invested. He's not really caring. So you have to try every angle with Him to get what you want. That's not what this is talking about here. That's, no. Approaching God through prayer is a humble endeavor. And every single prayer that we pray ought to be hinged in some variation of this theme. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will, Lord, Should you will it, O Lord, I will go here, I will go there, I will spend time in this city or that city. Should it be your will, O Lord, that you bless my life with this, I will, should it be your will, O Lord, that you take this thorn out of my flesh that's festering, that's causing me discomfort. Every single prayer we pray must be from that perspective. And this approach is contrary to some of the teaching that we see going around. And asking God for His will to be done is not a lack of faith. It's not a lack of faith. It's actually placing our trust in the God who knows what's absolutely best for our lives. God knows. And when He answers prayer... And he always answers. He always answers prayer in the light of the eternal glory. He always answers prayer with eternity in mind. Sometimes we, like, I don't know about you, I don't, I don't see what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. As a matter of fact, I might think that today this should happen, that should happen, I should be able to do this and that, and it's going to, Help my tomorrow, right? It's going to be better for me tomorrow. But I don't know that. That's God's realm. And we need to trust Him with our lives. And say, my life is yours, God. Whatever you want, I want. Whatever you want to do inside of me, this is what I desire. Should we lay out our requests and desires to God? Absolutely. Absolutely. Bring all sorts of requests before Him. But... um, you know, asking God to, there's, uh, I guess you could say, things that are directly spoken to in the Word. Directly. We can ask Him for things like, increase my strength, increase, like, like increase my faith. Help me to trust you, Lord. Help me to live at peace with my brothers and sisters. Help me to be able to love as you loved me and gave yourself for me. Help me to love 
others around me, these kind of things. We pray in, 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 in tow with God's word. And we know that when we pray those things, they are the will of God because that is God's word and it's revealed to us. So we pray with confidence for those things, knowing that God will answer us and will grant our requests. But there's also things that are indirectly. You know, there's a, God wants us to come to him with everything. You know, I'm not feeling well, Lord. I would sure appreciate a touch from you, Lord. Would you grant me healing? That's not a bad prayer to pray. God understands the feelings of our weakness. God, I have a specific need. Whether that's a physical need, whether something's going on financially or relationships, you know, like, God, help me to connect better with my children or my grandchildren or there's all kinds of indirect things as well that aren't specifically mentioned in the Word of God, but indirectly the principles are there. We should be asking God about that. Well, but how do we actually know the will of God? How do we know the will of God? We pray, if we pray in accordance with His will, He grants our request. But how do we know the will? We come to know the will of God by spending time with Him. You know, we don't pray. Um, we don't pray because we have to do some sort of jig to get God to do what we want. We pray because we want to know Him and the power of His resurrection. And we want to know relationship with him it's not about this distant thing and and i i see this in christendom and i've seen it over the years maybe you have experienced it and all that where where this separation is god wants us to come close to him come close to him relationship wise and when we pray thy will be done what we want what we want is we want god's heart and view on it if you spend some time with someone Kids, you guys might know this. If you spend some lots of time with somebody and you, you do lots of stuff together, do you think you're going to know that person better than if you spend absolutely zero time with them? Oh, yeah, for sure. And if you spend, if you spend more than just a, a, a little time with that person, you're going to get to know them even better, Right? Well, that's why you're, you're so close to your, your, a lot of you are really close to your moms and dads, right? Because you guys have spent so much time together. Well, if you want to hear the voice of God, you want to know the voice of God, you need to spend time with him. And it's not, this isn't a legalistic thing where, you know, the hammer is dropping, so you must, I must do, I must do, I must do. Then we get into this whole realm of, it's not relationships, it's robotics, it's like, you know, and, and we get, get this wrong. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To fear the Lord, yes, is to revere Him. Okay? It's to revere Him, but that does not indicate that He does not want us to draw close to Him. He wants us to be revering of Him because He is the creator of all things and we must honor Him and we must be respectful of Him. Why? Because He's good. He's our Father. He's the creator we bow the knee of our, our lives to him and submission to him, but we must not forget that with that power, God does not, <laughs> he does not lose that individual touch because the, the very core of God's nature is his love. Everything flows from it. So, so even though we fear him, you know, it's like John, like right, in the Revelation, when he saw Jesus in his unveiled glory, he fell at his feet as though dead. Like if we saw the Lord's glory in all of its brilliance right now, there's not a person here that would be sitting, we'd be bowed down. We would be bowed down because it's powerful. <laughs> but what did Jesus do? He came over to John and he put his hand on him and said, Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. And he proceeded to talk to him. 
This is what we have, my friends. If we know Jesus, we have this relational connection that is, that is there for the taking. So when we pray, it's not legalistic. I must pray five hours a day or I will not be acceptable to God or I must pray you know, three times a week or I will not be acceptable to God. No, it's, we pray because we want to know the, the Lord. We want to know Him and we want Him to, to live in and through us. We want to have that connection, that closeness with Him so that when we walk in our lives, He is our Daddy. He's our Abba. And we walk closely with our Abba. So, so why do we pray if God's all-knowing and He's sovereign? And He knows everything anyways. Why do we even pray? God's going to do what He wants to do because He knows the first, He knows the beginning from the end and everything in between. So what's the point of praying? Well, here's, here's a kind of a, a, a snapshot, I guess, an illustration, you would say, of kind of what God does with us as his kids. There's a guy named Phil Rezkala I was reading, and, and um, he's a Christian philosophy professor, but he says, he says this. He says it's kind of like the heart of a, a parent. He says, consider this. Okay, kids, you guys know this, right? When you're, when you're baking, uh, when your mom's baking in the kitchen, does she sometimes get you to come help her with something? Like, Maybe something small even. It doesn't even have to be big. But she wants you to help her. Well, see, a, a mother can bake a cake on her own, can't she? Can your mom bake a cake on her own? Yeah, she certainly can. And, uh, you know, she can bake on, a cake on her own. But sometimes she delights in having her children with her at the counter, reading the recipe if they're big enough. And uh, handing her the eggs and the flour and all the ingredients that make this wonderful, beautiful, excellent tasting cake. Right? Mom invites us to participate with her in the process of baking the cake. Wow. In the same way, God calls us to pray because, because God delights in enlisting us to help bring about His purposes in creation. That's, that's why he calls us alongside of him. And that's why Jesus had his 12 around him to pass on his heart to them. And, and he said, go into the world and preach the gospel, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go proclaim the word of the Lord. Why? Because God wants to partner with us. He doesn't need to but you're his child and he wants you to experience the joy of his good work. Awesome. Now, we're going to move on. John transitions from encouraging people to be confident in who they are in regards to their relationship with Christ, with assurance in prayer, to speak about life in the family of God and, and responsibility to help other people um, I, I think God has given us this unique um, position. I, I, I don't know how else to put it. We are a family. He's given us a unique position in His family. And He wants us to be like-minded to Him. So if what I explained about Ava and Daddy, you know, connects and how God desires that closeness and relationship to us. Did you know that he also desires that in his children, one for another? That same closeness. When you come to church, it's not all about ceremony. It's not all about a service where I come and just get something and I take off. It's not about that. What you heard Kareem talking about this morning is the heartbeat of Christ. God wants us to live for Him and live also for one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have one for another. How can we have love for one another if we absolutely have no time of day for one another? This is not 
this is not where it's supposed to be. This is not God's plan. It's contrary to God's plan. John makes it clear that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to one another as true, true, the true church, the believers in Jesus. We have a responsibility to take care of one another. Did you know that? And we also have the responsibility to pray for one another when we're struggling. If you see someone that's struggling in their life and they're having a hard time with an issue or something is not right, maybe, uh, I don't know, I don't want to use a name because there might be someone here with that name, but, you know, let's say Joe, okay? Is there a Joe here? No Joe? Good. Okay, <laughs> that's good. So Joe over there is having a struggle with a sin. You can see it. He's struggling. He's having a hard time. Well, what, is, what does love say about that? Yeah, we sh probably should talk with him, but... There's something more important than just talking with him. We ought to pray for him. Genuinely, from the heart, God, have mercy on him. Help him, Lord, in his time of struggle. Help him to break through this and give him life. John says in verse 16 and 17, if you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin. And there is, a, is sin that does not lead to death. So let's talk about the first part of that first. If you see someone struggling, they're having a hard time. Has anyone had struggles? You have struggles? Even kids have struggles sometimes, don't they? Has, everyone, has anyone struggled with something that they found really hard to overcome in their lives? Everyone say, I. I. Right. So, what does God say in His Word here? What does He say? Concerning prayers for brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling with sin, the Apostle Paul agrees with the Apostle John. In Galatians 6, 1, he says this. He says, Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch out yourselves, or else you also, you also may be tempted. So if you see someone struggling with something, how, what is the gentle approach? How do you do, deal with that? Well, yeah, there is absolutely a chain of things that take place, right? If someone says, yeah, you know what? I don't care what you say. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'm not, I, I, I'm not going to change. As a matter of fact, you can just take off. Well, there is a process with the elders of church discipline that will take place in that case. And someone might even actually be asked to leave if they're not willing to change and they're polluting the body of Christ by their behavior. That's the far-reaching. But right here, the first step, if that person is a believer in Christ, the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. And who is righteous among you? Is anyone here righteous? In ourselves, not a one. But with, with Christ, you are saints of the Most High God, not because of what you have done, but because of what He has done for you. You are saints in Christ. That means you are the righteousness of God in Christ, a brand new creation in Him. When you go before the throne of God if you're a true believer he will look at you and he will not see all the horrible things that you've done in the past in your life he's going to look at one thing and one thing only and that is what have you done with my son and if the answer is what have you done with Jesus is like I've tried to do it on my own it's going to be depart from me you work her of iniquity for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but the grace of God brings salvation. And that means by grace you are saved. 
And what does salvation mean? It means the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed upon you. You have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And that is a gift of God. That is a gift. It's such a beautiful gift. When I think of things that I've done in my life, am I able to stand in heaven before God when that day comes? Absolutely not. Not on my own. But by Jesus' blood that was shed for me, I can confidently say, I am yours. And when the Lord looks at us, he sees purity because he sees Jesus. That's what the sacrifice is all about. And his love, his blood does not just cover our sins, my friends. Not like the Old Testament where the sacrifices were a temporary covering. His blood takes care of our sins and cleanses us from our sins and washes them away as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. Isn't that good news? <laughs> That's why we can have our heart filled with joy and love. Thank you, Jesus. That should put it in our heart. Lord, I was lost, but you've saved me. Thank you. You are my Savior. You're my God, and I, I love you. Oh, and I want to obey you. I want to follow you. You're the creator of the universe and you call me to walk with you? Are you kidding me? You're the creator of all things. You spoke the stars into existence. You created all the life that is on the earth and everything. You created all that. Yet you want me to walk with you? You want me to live my life close to you? Oh God. All I want to do is serve you. All I want to do is live my life in submission to your will. May your will be done, O oh God, on earth as it is in heaven. James 3.2 says, We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. In 1 John 1.8 and 9, we are told, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and He is just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar and the tr His Word is not in us. So, do you need help when you're struggling? You do. You see, your sins have been paid for by the blood of Christ. But God saved us so that we could walk with him in holiness. Not so we could just wipe our feet off and continue in wicked behaviors, in wicked, the wickedness of our pasts. Not so we can just go and have this grace card to sin and sin and sin and sin and sin. That's not God's plan. So we pray for God to give life to those who have committed sins that are not leading to death. Now, the next little piece in that scripture has caused a lot of puzzling with people scratching their heads going, what are you talking about? What does this mean? Um, he also says that there is a sin that leads to death and we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't pray about that. So, this has puzzled many people over the years and I went to a lot of different sources and read a lot of stuff about this. And um, it boils down to there's two primary ways of looking at this particular passage. And I'm going to explain them both to you. I mean, I have a personal conviction about which one of them is right, and I'll share that with you too. But there's two, and there's divided, scholarship is divided over this a bit. But either way, it's, it's um, an interesting thing to explore. Um, there's two primary ways of looking at the passage that talks about a sin leading to death and not praying for that. And, and the first has to do with the sins leading to death. And the view is that this, is probably, this could be talking about um, sins that have corporal punishment associated to them. So in other words, if I went and killed somebody and I had a death sentence uh, over me, for capital punishment, that it's probably, it's not appropriate for me to be praying to God that I shouldn't face that sentence for committing that crime. Uh, that's, that's one 
viewpoint on this. Some, uh, some scholars have surmised that he might be saying that we shouldn't be praying for God to physically deliver those from consequences leading to capital punishment, but they, we need to entrust that to God. Um, it also may be that, uh, in the same thought process, where people have committed capital offenses before God, we, we shouldn't necessarily, well, we shouldn't pray for that, that he would deliver them from that. Uh, I don't know. Um, the example that's used in the books here um, is the example of Ananias and Sapphira, where you guys know the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts. Um, in the book of Acts chapter 5, the first verse 11 First 11 verses are dedicated to the story of Ananias and Sapphira. They're two people in the early church that sold this property and they wanted to look good. They wanted to look holy and they wanted to look great before men. So they took the, the proceeds from the sale of their property and brought it to the apostles' feet. And each of them, one at a time, basically what they claimed was that this money, this is the entire money from the entire sale of our property. And here, use it for the benefit of the church. So they laid it at the apostles' feet and, hey, this is not the truth. <laughs> they actually had reserved secretly a part of this money for themselves and only had brought a portion of it, but yet they told the apostles that it was all of it. Guess what happened? Boom! Ananias was the first one. He fell over dead. And his wife came in later and the apostles confirmed with her and said, is this what happened with your money? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what, this is all the money. Guess what happened to her? Boom. She fell over dead too. God required their life of them right there and then. That was capital punishment from God for an offense. Okay, so take that uh, as part of the consideration. This is the, you know, God is holy. And this is why when we take communion even, right, in 1 Corinthians Chapter 11, verses 21 to 31, in the early church, there were people that were going to the communion table, you know, where we take the bread and we take the, the drink, the, 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 the fruit of the vine, the, the, the wine, and, and, and we drink of that in remembrance of the broken body and blood of Christ. And there were some people that were going to these, these uh, places where they were having communion and they weren't concerned about the broken body and blood of Christ. They were hungry and they were thirsty. So they were grabbing the bread and they were eating the bread to satisfy their own hunger. And that was their purpose in doing what they were doing. And they were drinking the drink. And some of them were even getting drunk in Corinth on the wine that they were being served for communion. Treating the holy thing that God had asked believers to do in remembrance of Him as unholy. And what does the Bible say about this? So then whenever... So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regards to ourselves, we would not come under, come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will be not finally condemned with the world. So you hear that? The capital, there's a capital punishment here in some cases. I, I don't know anyone personally who dropped dead during a communion service. But no, honestly, there's judgment. God takes us seriously. We don't, we don't treat that thing that Jesus asked us to do in a trite manner. This is very sobering, and it is important for us to recognize the body and blood of Christ. So, anyways, that being said, they've lumped that and Ananias and Sapphira with this thought that we shouldn't pray for that sin leading to death. The second possible interpretation of our text, which I believe my personal conviction is that it is right, is that John is saying that we need not pray that God would give life to those who have shown themselves to be wolves in sheep clothing. 
people that were among us, that were ravenous wolves, that have gone out. They have shown themselves to be antichrist and destroyers and deceivers of the true church. <sighs> this is a tough one. It may be John's suggestion here that this has something to do with, um, I guess, in the early church, near the end of the age of the apostles, there were false teachers that were rising up and they're producing, I, I, I talked a bit about this last week about Gnosticism. I'm not going to go into that again. Okay? But there were in fact people that were teaching things that were contrary to the, what the apostles were teaching. They were living a different life. They were leading people astray to a gospel that wasn't the gospel. They were they were preying on people. They were, people were being preyed upon. And John actually spoke of this in 1 John 2, 18 and 19. He spoke about this and he said, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that their Antichrist is coming, and now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it's the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but go, their going showed that none of them belonged to us. John speaks of these people as having attended the Christian assemblies of true believers. They claimed to be Christians, but inwardly they had never surrendered their hearts to Christ. Their faith was not a true faith. It was unspiritual. It was non-saving faith, the faith of demons who don't deny the existence of Jesus Christ, but they do not submit to his authority over them. And that is not saving faith. The false teachers in this day and age, in the early church of Gnosticism, which I spoke about last week, were, were causing real trouble in the assemblies. And um, the Apostle Peter also speaks about these teachers, these people. In 2 Peter chapter 2, 1 to 3, but there were, also, there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many who will follow their depraved conduct and will be, bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. And he goes on, Peter goes on in the same chapter in verse 17 saying, these are, peep, these are springs without water, mist driven by, by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. For they mouth empty boastful words and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entire, entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and again are entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have better for, been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of this the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. Heavy words. False teachers. They're still around. It may be that these false teachers whom John was talking about were leading a great many people away from the true gospel. And in that state of being, it would not be appropriate to pray that God would give them life despite what they were doing to his flock. But John, so, he says that there are those whose sin does not lead to death and we should pray for those people that they will receive life. This is why John states and I'm going to say it again, if you see a brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray that God would give them life. You know, interestingly enough, there's a context here. I don't know if you've caught it. 
when we look at the Word of God, we don't just look piece, pieces of verses here and there and pull that out and, and build doctrines on, on one verse here and one verse there. We, we need to look at the context. And, you know, when we look at the, this in context, John explains why praying this prayer for a struggling brother or sister to overcome their sin is, in fact, praying in accordance with the will of God. In proper context, what I just read to you about in verse 16, we ought to be reading verses 14 and 15 in the light of verse 16 as well, right? So in verse 14 and 15, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Doesn't that bring it into clarity? This context is talking about praying for believers who are struggling in their faith with sin issues. And that God will, will answer your prayer and will give life to those believers. That's what this scripture is properly context in. So yes, should we ask God for all kinds of prayers? There's other scriptures that say yes, we should. All kinds of requests bring before him. Great and small, little things and big things. But in context, this has nothing to do with a blank slate like we hear so many times over the airwaves or the internet. We hear false teachers, prosperity teachers that are telling people to claim for themselves whatever they wish in Jesus' name and it will be done for them. That is not what this scripture is talking about. Some people who falsely taught the scripture shows us we can name it, claim it, and it will be given to us because God wants us to always be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous and everything in the, in the ways of, in the things of this world. If we want a mansion, we can claim it. We can name it and claim it. I claim my mansion. I claim my, uh, my million dollars. All this stuff, you hear this on the internet. It's all baloney. It's all nonsense. It's got nothing to do with the plan of God. God says be content in whatever circumstance he gives you. If he makes you wealthy, he gives you wealth so that you can share it, so you can help others who are in need. But it is not this thing, this twisted thing. This scripture has been so contorted and twisted. This scripture is about praying for people who are struggling through sin. That's what it's about in context. God will grant your request. If, uh, so, there is security in Jesus. God wants us to be secure in who we are in Him. And He also wants us to be secure in our relationships with one another if I don't care about the other guy next to me that's a believer, I need a heart check here. Yeah. My love has grown cold towards God because you can't have a heart that despises the person next to you and have your heart in tune with Jesus. It doesn't work that way. We love God first because he first loved us. And then his love fills our heart and pours over and becomes loving other people practically in the, and meeting their needs. And when we see them struggling, we care deeply about them. Okay. So, God will give life to the ones who are his when brothers and sisters pray for them as they are struggling with sin. Remember that partnership thing that I talked with you about? This is part of the partnership. God wants you to pray for the next person so that he can work and he can save their life. Isn't that beautiful? We pray for them. You got someone in your family that's a prodigal that had a genuine faith in Christ? You pray for them. God will bring them life. Trust the Lord. This is his word. Earlier in his letter, John said in 1 John 4, 4, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because 
the one who is in you than it is greater than the one who is in the world. You know, we have a very real spiritual enemy, the devil and his demons, that want to take you out, they want to bring you down, and they want to destroy your witness for Christ. It's very real. But you know something? The Lord has given us his provisions to be overcomers. And when we call upon the name of the Lord and we put our trust in the Lord and lean not on our own understanding, we acknowledge him. He makes our paths straight and he answers our prayers and he fights for us. No weapon formed against us prospers. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So if you see an impossible circumstance out there, you see someone, I don't know how my daughter or son or uncle or grandpa is going to come to Jesus. I don't know how it's going to happen, God, but you know. You know the secret to their heart and I'm calling on you, Lord. Maybe I've got a backslidden you know, mother or father. God, you see them. Have mercy, Lord. Show them the key to what they've been holding back on. Break that out of them, Lord. Answer that prayer, Lord. We call upon you, Lord. These are the kind of prayers that God desires us to pray. Well, God can shatter the sin shackles on people. Believe it. There is no sin that can hold people when God intervenes. Sometimes it appears impossible. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Call upon his name. Pray. Seek his face. He will answer you. There's security in Jesus. And then the apostle ends with this. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe and the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are the children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We also know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. We are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. That is good news. God keeps us safe, friends. And your brothers and sisters, people that you know that are, that are believers that are struggling through sin, God loves them. He's going to take, take care of things. But he's asking you to partner with, with him in praying for them. Amen? Amen. And then he ends with verse 21 saying, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Wholehearted devotion. Anything that comes between us and him. John's like, this is so important, people. Don't let anything come between your relationship with Jesus Christ and you. If there's something that's in between that relationship, get rid of it. Walk away from it. Turn your back on it. The sin so that easily entangles God gives you overcoming power. You are not bound by the shackles of sin any longer. You're not a slave. You have a choice. God gives you that choice and he's given you the Holy Spirit and the power to be an overcomer. And folks, you need each other. You need one another. Don't ignore one another. Walk closely with one another. Pray for one another. Meet with one another. Open the word of God together with one another as families. Spend time with your kids together in prayer, in the word. These are important things. And that's what's going to take you through.